Hello and welcome to Japanology Plus. I'm Peter Barakan. I'm in a place called Funabori, which is in Edogawa Ward on the eastern edge of Tokyo. Our theme for today is up on the wall behind me there, goldfish, and the Edogawa area is famous for farming them. Goldfish are a familiar sight in Japan. Many people keep them as pets, and going back in history, they've been used as motifs in traditional painting, for example, and in kimono design. You'll see them in all sorts of places. On today's program, we'll take a look at the popularity of goldfish and their place in Japanese culture. But let's start off with a look at the fish themselves. There are thought to be over 100 varieties of goldfish in the world and 30 to 40 of those are commonly found in Japan. The breeds differ in many ways, including color and shape. Let's look at a few examples. First, the wakin, a fish known for its slim body. It's thought to be the progenitor of all Japanese goldfish. Next, the ryukin, a round fish with long, elegant fins. Since the 18th century, this has been one of the most popular breeds in Japan. Here we have hamanishiki. It has a distinctive heart-shaped lump on its head. Next, something even more out of the ordinary. The eyes of the Chotengan variety are turned upwards. This breed was once exclusive to the Chinese imperial court. It arrived in Japan in the early 20th century. Just as striking is the Sui Hogan breed. A genetic mutation gave it two large balloon-shaped sacs underneath its eyes. Finally, Lanchu known in Japan as the king of goldfish. It has a lump on its head and no dorsal fin. A single fish can cost hundreds of thousands or even millions of yen. Lanchu are often described as living works of art or swimming sculptures. Goldfish shows are held to determine which Lanchu are the most beautiful. Breeders put a great deal of time and effort into raising the perfect fish for these events. It is vital to select the most promising fry before they change color. A group of 3,000 newly hatched fish go through a six-month selection process. The shape of the tail and the back help to determine the 10 or so fish that are ultimately chosen. Here's a fully grown Lanchu. It has a colorful rounded body. But can you tell why it's known as the king of goldfish? To find out, we're going to hear from Kawada Yonosuke, a goldfish expert who has published many books on the subject. He is a tireless promoter of these attractive fish. So, Kawada-san, do you actually keep goldfish yourself? I've been keeping them for 60 years. What? <laughs> How did that start? When I was a youngster, my grandfather kept oh. all sorts of different goldfish. I found them really fascinating. And that's how I became such a big fan. Wow. I've been looking after goldfish myself since my first year of primary school. OK, that's, that's a long, long time. <laughs> OK. We're visiting a goldfish hatchery that has been operating since 1837. Great big ones here. What are these? These are ranchu. Hmm the breed often described as the king of goldfish. What makes them so regal? On their heads, they have a bump, a raised growth. Do you see? Hmm. It looks like a crown. Ah. <laughs> also, 
Fish usually have dorsal fins, but Ranchu don't have one. They have plump bodies with a flat back. One point about goldfish is that they were bred to look good when viewed from above. Ranchu look especially elegant, and they have a simple shape. These features make them stand out. Oh, so they would look good from above? Yes, exactly. OK, OK. What makes it so hard to breed them without the dorsal fins? Breeders have been working since the 19th century to stabilize and maintain this variety of goldfish. But genetically speaking, that hasn't yet been achieved. Only a certain proportion end up checking all the necessary boxes. It's a real challenge. OK, OK. What are these ones over here? Are these the same? These are Ranchu Fry, hatched this year. Oh, so these will grow up to be like this? Yes. They're a much paler colour now, of course. But when do they start acquiring this deep orange tone to them? It's different for each fish. But for these, it will take another month or two. What is it that gives them this distinctive colour? That comes from certain ingredients in the food that we give them. Some plants, including particular varieties of marine mm. algae, contain pigment. When the goldfish eat those plants, they absorb the pigment and take on a bright red colour. Oh. Mm. Also, the colour of the container we keep them in affects the strength of the tone. Mm. A black container makes a stronger colour develop more quickly. Interesting. OK. <laughs> it's, it's interesting, There's, the sizes are different, the colours are different, the patterns are different. I mean, we're talking about goldfish, but there's so many different kinds. Yes, there really are. Mm. But they all have the same origin. They all came from the Wakin breed. Oh. So let's take a moment to think about how that was done. You'll already know that human beings have two different chromosomes. X and Y, yeah. Fish in the carp family, such as goldfish, have four. That makes each breed much more likely to produce mutations. Oh, I see. So they're more prone to mutation because they have four chromosomes? Yes. Around 20 million years have passed since the carp family of fish first appeared. The genus established itself naturally. In the present day, humans have bred many different varieties of goldfish. But if humans took a step back and let the fish reproduce naturally, they'd all turn back into carp. Oh, wow. We can look at it on a genetic level. Goldfish emerged in China 1,500 to 2,000 years ago and in Japan around 500 years ago. Genetically speaking, that's nothing compared to 20 million years. So when goldfish reproduce, they're predisposed to generating examples of carp DNA. That's what's going on. That's really interesting. Very <laughs> interesting. Are there any major differences in the way that they're bred in Japan and China? In China, they enjoy producing a great number of mutations. They're less concerned about stabilizing those mutations into a new breed. Interesting fish are appreciated individually. For example, let's look at the Cho Tengun variety with its upturned eyes. <laughs> they look like they've come out of a cartoon. Sorry, guys, it wasn't meant as an insult. Supposedly, in order to produce fish like this, Chinese breeders put goldfish mm. in pots with a very narrow opening at the top. They only admitted a very small circle of light. Eventually, that resulted in fish with eyes pointed directly upwards. Well, that's the story, at least. However these fish were created, 
they certainly look unique. In Japan, meanwhile, the emphasis was on propagating interesting features until a new type of goldfish was created. Breeders would refine and improve appearance until it satisfied them aesthetically. That was their approach. Here we have a red and white breed. It's called Sakura Nishiki. It actually came from the variety you see next to it, Edo Nishiki, which is red, white and black. The two types are essentially the same, aside from the black colouring. When the three-colour breed was being developed, some fish happened to have just two colours. That wasn't what the breeders were after. Even so, they looked at the two-colour fish and thought, well, this is good too. They took a shine to it. They decided to aim for a fish with no dorsal fin and a red and white colouring. Those colours resemble cherry blossoms or sakura which are widely admired in Japan. Hmm. So the breed was named Sakura Nishiki. Artistic quality as well. It takes an aesthetic sense, imagination, and unwavering determination to bring a new breed to life. Mm -hmm. The breeders set themselves a challenge, and they don't give up. Hmm. Stabilizing this breed took a great deal of time, over a decade, in fact. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello. I hear you've been in business here for about 180 years. Why did Edowawa become famous for farming goldfish? Well, goldfish farming took off here at a time when Edogawa was still lotus fields, rice fields and swamps. It was mostly wetland. At the time, goldfish were transported across the country by train. Those trains would stop in Asakusa in Tokyo. Goldfish wholesalers would congregate there and they soon decided to farm goldfish themselves. They formed family businesses in the Edogawa area. Edogawa was an ideal place for goldfish because of its wetlands. The industry reached its peak in around 1950, when there were over 30 hatcheries. Today, there are only two or three. Do you still farm fish here? Although we still sell goldfish here, they're farmed hmm. elsewhere in Ibaraki Prefecture. Uh, are there any species that you yourself have actually created? Breeds? Yes, uh, these ones here, in fact. Oh, these? In this tank. Five-colour goldfish were quite popular at the time, so I decided to produce a new five-colour breed. This was around mm. ten years ago. Was it hard to get this balance? The more colours there are, the messier the pattern mm. can get. So, yes, it was tricky to produce fish with a good balance. Mm. Mm. You were saying that the farming has mostly moved outside Tokyo now, but you still maintain this shop here. Why is that? Historically, Edogawa has been one of Japan's top three goldfish production centres. Running a business here is my way of honouring that aspect of its identity. Mm. Maintaining the tradition. Absolutely. In China, around 1500 to 1800 years ago, genetic mutation produced a red-coloured variety of carp. These fish were bred over and over until eventually goldfish were created. Those fish were introduced to Japan in the 16th century, and that first breed was given the name Wakin, meaning Japan goldfish. At the time, they were luxury possessions owned only by the wealthy upper classes. In the 17th century, goldfish became a source of local pride. Aristocrats competed to have the most unique and beautiful specimens. The area around Nagoya had jikin, 
a breed with a divided tail that is compared to a pair of peacock fans. This goldfish is thought to have a dignified, noble appearance. The Kochi region had Tosakin, whose own unique tail has been compared to the raiment of a celestial maiden. To create this unusual tail, the fish are raised in a round bowl. They swim in circles, which is what makes their tails curl in such an attractive way. Next, Izumo Nankin from the Shimane region. The local lord, Matsudaida Fumai, was a renowned master of the tea ceremony. He was a reserved man who advocated for elegance and simplicity. The Izumo Nankin was created to embody those ideals. Its red mouth, round body, and glittering silver coloring communicate a quiet dignity. In the 19th century, goldfish ownership spread to the general public. Samurai started raising goldfish to help make ends meet in a time of peace. The fish were produced in great quantities. Originally, there were no glass tanks. Instead, goldfish were kept in porcelain containers and viewed mostly from above. In due course, small, transparent glass containers were produced. These made it easier to admire goldfish from any angle. Later still, goldfish scooping became a popular activity at summer festivals. Families would take home the goldfish they caught. Watching them swim was thought to offer a cooling effect during the hot and humid summer months. So what have we got here? Goldfish on everything. Little lanterns, those are nice too. Cups, saucers, bowls. I don't know if I've been in Japan for too long, but I don't remember seeing these kind of goldfish designs back in London when I was living there. Well, that's a long, long time ago. Is this something that's pretty much unique to Japan, I wonder? Well, goldfish designs are certainly very common here. You see them on items for children. And a geisha's ornate hairpin might feature a decorative goldfish design or motif. Why do you think they're so popular? Here in Japan, they're seen as auspicious. Another factor is their red color. It's thought to ward off misfortune. The gates at Japanese shrines often use the same color. Is that why they're red? I didn't know that. And, oh, <laughs> they got scooping. <laughs> did you do this as a kid? I certainly did. Uh, Have you ever tried it yourself? Uh, I don't remember if I ever did it in England. I think they might have had something similar. I tried it in Japan a couple of times, absolutely. Hopeless. <laughs> Will you give it a go? Why not? Here's the scoop. This, it's kind of slightly rough on one side and smooth on the other side. Which side do you use? This is the smooth front and this is the rough back. OK, so the smooth side's on top. Yes. OK. Can you give him some tips? You have to be gentle and careful. Mm. If you pull the scoop straight up, it'll break. Oh. But if you move it horizontally, you can stop that from happening. Oh. So you, you... No, not like that. Oh. That puts pressure on the scoop. Oh. Slide it in at a 45 oh. degree angle, then move it horizontally. When you've got a goldfish, bring it up slowly. They're all running away. Let's try it again. Here we go. Oh! Ah. <laughs> do, you, do you just wait for one to come? Or do you move it? Well, 
if you do move the scoop, try to see things from the viewpoint of the uh. fish and anticipate where they're going to go. Ooh. That's it, yes. Got him, got him, got him, got him, got him, got him. There you go. Finally got one. Oh. <laughs> I wonder if I can get a black one. I thought it got... A... Oh, it has, it's got a hole in it. That means it's hopeless now, right? <laughs> oh, well, never mind. At least I got one. When I was a child, I'd spend all my pocket money on goldfish scooping. I remember this one man running a stall. He said, hey, kid, great work. It's my last day here, so take any goldfish you like. Oh. That's what he said. He was a really nice guy. I still remember that day. Hmm. I took my fish home and really looked after it. Oh. From around the 18th century, goldfish designs started to adorn many everyday objects. Goldfish appealed to the many Japanese who enjoyed delicate motifs embodying natural beauty and vitality. Fukahori Ryusuke conveys those features in a new artistic form. These fish look like they're about to start swimming, but in fact, they've been painted. Fukahori is internationally renowned for his depictions of goldfish. Here, he slowly builds up an image using layers of acrylic resin, around 20 layers altogether. When combined, they form a realistic three-dimensional fish. It appears to float. When viewed from the side, however, nothing is visible at all. People often think I copy from a photograph, but I work without any reference at all. I simply paint a fish swimming around. It's not a fish I've seen anywhere. It's just an expression of an image in my mind. That's what I do. Fukahori has been painting goldfish ever since a life-changing moment in the year 2000. Back then, he was a struggling artist. One day, he found himself looking at his somewhat neglected fish tank. For years, he had paid little attention to the goldfish in it. I took the lid off and found myself gazing down at a goldfish. Its back was so beautiful, a vivid red. I'd forgotten how amazing that colour could be. I'll never forget that moment. That's what I strive to recreate. The beauty Fukahori saw that day inspired him to create countless works featuring goldfish. We take carp and give them a red colour, frilly bits, or a lump on their head. Humans have remodelled them. And that might, in fact, be very sinful. Nevertheless, it's a sin that ended up changing my life for the better. I sometimes think goldfish were put in this world to bear the burden of the human ego. Kind of a weird place. <laughs> Whoa. Oh my God, are all these goldfish? It's hard to tell what color they are because they're all lit up red. Oh, and blue. Gosh. Whoa. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen so many goldfish in one place before. Goldfish were originally developed to be ornamental, 
We showcase them in this museum using sound, scent and lighting. You can enjoy viewing goldfish in many different ways. Do you have any recommendations for us to see? The name of this exhibit is literally New Goldfish Show. It's different from other exhibits in that it focuses attention on goldfish from above. Oh, these ones aren't very gold, are they? There are a lot of rare goldfish swimming in these tanks. You're unlikely to see many of them anywhere else. Overall, there are 24 breeds on display. OK. The water's very still, the base is white. It's very kind of almost antiseptic, perhaps taking it too far, but very, very clean. Obviously, fish have a metabolism. What happens to what comes out? In these tanks, the water is constantly being replaced. There's a steady flow in and out, and that creates an ideal environment for goldfish. What's the fascination for you with goldfish? Well, regardless of the breed, they're really cute. That's one factor. They react when you say something to them, or when you come home. Really? Yes. A kind of bond forms between the fish and the owner. And that's adorable. Without a human looking after them, there's no way for goldfish to survive. A healthy goldfish implies a healthy owner in mind and body. When you look after their needs, the goldfish reflect that. They're like a mirror of the owner. When Japan went through long periods of war, putting effort into caring for a goldfish was seen as a bad use of time and money. It was uneconomical, and few people did it. But in times of peace, people do take an interest in goldfish and their beauty. When everyday life is settled, goldfish quickly become popular again. So that's another way to see goldfish, mm. as a symbol of peace. Mm. They do definitely have a very peaceful vibe about them, don't they? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>